as you go through this outline of the Hebrew Roots Movement. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Uh, now, I just want to I just want to be as uh, level-headed as I can be and as fair as I possibly can be because the Hebrew Roots Movement does not have any kind of organizational structure such as the uh, Mormon religion or the Roman Catholic religion or the Jehovah Witness religion or, or even Scientology or some of the other cultic groups. Uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement seems to be a, a loosely amalgamated association of uh, men and women who have uh, come across an idea. And the idea is that evangelicals are going to be far better off if they some way, somehow tie into or attach themselves to the roots of Christianity. And they, of course, would say the root of Christianity lies in the observance of the Torah of the uh, nation of Israel. Now, in my research, uh, and I think anybody who is fair would say the same thing, it is awfully hard to get a handle on exactly what is being taught in every individual Hebrew roots movement That's correct. There's society. A, it's a diversity out there. There is a broad span of diversity, and it's almost impossible to say that this particular group is going to say the same thing as this particular group. But I think we can analyze it in broad terms and then get down to specifics because they have had a number of authors write a number of uh, books. Mm -hmm. And I'll be interacting in particular with one of their more scholarly authors on this uh, entire question. But uh, as far as overall presupposition from what I have been able to find, the Hebrew Roots Movement does want to affirm that we are saved by grace through faith. Uh, of course, the Roman Catholic religion says we're saved by grace through faith as well. It's just the identification of what it means when they say grace and what they mean by faith that is the sticking point. It's semantics. It's semantics. Uh, apparently, when they say we are saved by grace through faith, this means that we only enter into God's family by faith alone and grace alone. In other words, we get into the house of God by grace alone and faith alone. But in order to remain in the house, we must follow the rule of the house. This is a theme that is repeated over and over again within their congregations. We come to Christ by faith in Christ alone, and it's by the grace of God alone that we come to Christ. But once we come to Christ, we have a responsibility to obey the rules of the household of God. And for them, that rule is Torah. Now, there is very little theological coherence even at the start of all of this. The nature of faith and grace is not discussed by anyone that I have read of their writers. At some points, following the rules is evidence of true faith. At other points, following the rules brings about true faith. And uh, at other points, not following the rules means eviction. However, eviction is never defined. They want to keep this kind of symmetrical analogy going that you get into the house by faith and grace, you only are allowed to stay in the house if you follow Torah. If you don't follow Torah, then you get booted out of the house. But they never go so far as to say what the booting out means. Eternal condemnation, eternal hell, loss of salvation. They don't say. It's unclear if eviction means losing one's salvation. But one can get convict, uh, evicted, and evidently, if one decides to follow the rules, he'll be let back into the house. So I think we've got a combination, for sure, her, uh, of, uh, of the worst part of Arminian theology, the idea that you can be saved, lose your salvation, gain your salvation, lose your salvation, and it's all dependent upon mm -hmm. you and what you do in the house. But we also have this idea that uh, the, the rules, whereas in... In uh, Arminianism, the rules are sort of made up by the people themselves. Mm. Here, the rule is Torah. They're going back to something that they, and we'll get into that, uh, uh, what that means in just a minute. We can safely say that based upon the writings and the teachings of the, uh, the people who are writing uh, for this particular movement, 
eternal security seems to be denied, perseverance of the saints is denied, continuation of suspected salvation is dependent upon or evidenced by following Torah. Now I made a note here that's very important. It is unclear whether following Torah gains salvation, maintains salvation, or has nothing to do with salvation. Oh, may I interject at yes. this point, just because uh, I just realized, and I should have brought this up sooner, mm -hmm. but because I know what Torah is, right. but it just dawned on me that there's probably some viewers you've got out there that don't even know what you're talking about when you mention Torah, so we might want to define what Torah is. Right. Well, when they say Torah, they're generally speaking of the law of God in the Old Testament. It generally refers to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, specifically Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, the Torah to them is the guide of life, and the, uh, the guide of life is uh, uh, m most evidenced in the law that God gave to the nation of Israel through Moses, and, it's, uh, and we'll get into the extent of that and how they follow that and what that means in a minute. But basically, Torah to them is more the law of God, although to the Jewish community, the Torah would be far more expansive than that. Torah would include both the law, the writings, and the prophets, and Torah would be a part of something greater than that called the Talmud. But we're not going to deal with that now. We're just going to deal with this idea of following stipulations and laws that were originally given to the nation of Israel. Now, there, there, is, uh, there is some confusion among the writers. We're not sure if a failure to... to comply to this group's idea of Torah obedience makes one least in the kingdom of God, yet still in, the least in the kingdom of God and not blessed here on earth, yet still in, or kicked out of the kingdom of God temporarily until one repents and starts following Torah, or permanently if one does not agree to follow Torah. There are absolutely no concrete uh, stipulation in their writings that you can lose your salvation or that you can't lose your salvation or that you can lose blessing or that you can't lose blessing that it's just simply such a young movement that everybody keeps talking about Torah 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 but the application of it and the implications of it mm -hmm. are almost too elusive for us to define also what exactly is entailed in obeying Torah is extremely elusive. And if that's not elusive enough, what are the penalties for non-compliance? That is almost impossible to understand in their writing. The words of this movement of Jesus are more important than the words of Paul. That is a theme that goes all throughout. And that's a warning sign for all Christians. What they're saying is that if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, and the words of Jesus are in red letters, those words are more significant and uh, more binding on your conscience than anything else in the New Testament. So they would be willing to say that Jesus trumps the Apostle Paul. Right. And of course, that's fracturing of Scripture, and it's denying that God sovereignly uh, inspired the men who wrote the New Testament as being the source of In fact, of all some of it. those, not all of them, but some of them go so far as to say Paul was a false prophet. Because they understand right. what they're saying about keeping Torah and all that stuff right. and what Paul is saying right. about the same thing. This is, they're, they're trying to drive a wedge between Paul and Jesus in most all of their writings, mm -hmm. and we're going to see that. Uh, finally, I want to just make in the introductory comments that Matthew 5.17 is a critical passage for this movement. And I just want to turn there and... Uh, quote for us, Matthew 5.17, so that we can have an idea of what we're dealing with. Matthew 5.17 falls on the Sermon on the Mount, first part of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus looks, looks at his disciples who have gathered around him, and he's teaching them in the sermon, and he says these words, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
virtually all of the Hebrew Roots Movement writers are camping out in Matthew 5, 17 through 19. And their position on this is that Jesus never came to annul, do away with any part of the law. Hence, we are still under that law, which they call Torah. Okay, right. we're going to get to that passage right. at some point. But I just wanted you to know that. Now, in every movement, there is a, an appeal to Scripture. And HRM, which I'm going to call them from now on, Hebrew Roots Movement, HRM, is no exception. They use the Bible. And if you know anything about Christian answers, and if you know <laughs> anything about what uh, uh, Larry has talked about for the last 25 years, he would be the first to stand up and say, all cults use the Bible. <laughs> it's how they use the Bible that's important.